Hey, we are proud to partner with the National Concealed Carry Association as a 10-ring partner. NCCA exists to serve the Second Amendment community by providing a nationwide network of QA advocates, offer elite self-defense and concealed carry training from the nation's top instructors, and provide rock-bottom prices on the best selection of gear and accessories. You can learn a whole lot more. Just go to National Concealed Carry Association. Dot com. All right, Mike, who have you got for a caller? We have a very interesting guest, Amy Dillon. No relation to John Dillon, our favorite attorney out here in San Diego. Um, Amy is, uh, I don't even know where to start, man. She's got so much on her uh, on her bio. She's on Gun Freedom Radio. Um, she's a former Marine Corps drill instructor, combat marksmanship instructor. She's a firearms instructor and chief range safety officer. Uh, NRA certified. She does all wow. kinds of stuff. Uh, so we wanted to get her on the radio. Like I said, uh, today or this month's theme is activism. So we wanted to get Amy on the on the horn and talk about activism. Amy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. How many? Let me to get everything that you've done onto one resume. I mean, what do you use like font like one or two? I mean, <laughs> you've done so much. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have been in the firearms industry for the past 10 years. And um, just to just to shorten it up a bit, I tell everyone I'm, I'm, I'm an instructor, I'm a writer, I'm a um, competitive shooter, and I call myself a Second Amendment advocate as well. And that kind of comes naturally with everything I do. Mm-hmm. You kind of have to be. If you're a gun owner these days, you can't afford to not be an activist. activist. You, yes. You know, that's the message that we really are trying to get across, because especially in the last few years, I feel that it's important for every gun owner to really be an advocate for the Second Amendment, because otherwise, I mean, it's it's literally an attack on our rights happening right now. And, and we're seeing that with with all these bills that are introduced, not only in the, uh, you know, on the federal side, but individual states as well. And I know California is, you know, in the fight every day. No, we're, we're good to go out here. It's actually oh, it's, no, no, no. We're, we're the, fine. We're the very Everything's <laughs> great very definition here. of gun freedom. So we're just bored. Mo- we thought we'd do a gun state, show. Right? <laughs> now, what do, I, do you, <laughs> you mind? Know, what's what state do you actually live in? If you don't mind me asking. Oh uh, no, I don't mind at all. Well, I'm I'm kind of a nomad. Um, I travel a lot, uh, quite frequently for work. I actually am from San Diego. I grew up in North uh, North County. Hmm. San Diego. Uh, right before I, I enlisted in the Marines, I, I was there, and I'm still there a few times a year. So, uh, the California gun laws that are, you know, happening are definitely impact me whenever I'm there. Um, but I, I used to reside in South Carolina. Recently moved to Georgia, and I'm splitting time between Georgia and Texas uh, right now with my fiance. So nice. Uh, I'm kind of all over the place. <laughs> so, what, you, how long were you in the Marine Corps? I was active duty for 13 years. Wow. wow. What uh, what made you join the Marine Corps? You know, I come from a family that has a long history of naval tradition, the U.S. Navy, but I was a rebel and decided to enlist in the Marine Corps. And, you know, I, I, was, I just wanted a challenge. I, I was kind of a rebel when I was a teenager, so I, I knew that I had to do something to kind of straighten my life out. And, you know, I don't know, something called, something was just, calling to me to the Marine Corps. So I decided to, to go for it. And it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I, I have no regrets about my time, well, time in well, service. Joe here in the studio, he was in the Navy. He says the Marine Corps is the Navy. Is that? Oh. <laughs> all hate that calls, true? 1-800-JOE. All hate calls, no, 1-800-JOE. Not quite the Navy, a subsidiary of the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you this. My dad, was he was a Navy chief and – he used to tell me that all the time, and my <laughs> reply back to him was always, "Well, the Marine, yes, the Marine Corps is a department of the Navy, but it is the men's department." So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> very good. I like that. I love it. <laughs> so, did, now is that being in the Marine Corps is that what what sparked an interest in firearms, or did that exist prior? Well, actually, the first time I shot a gun was was in boot camp, learning you know learning on the service rifle that we had at the time. Um, so I, I knew about firearms. My, my dad had firearms in the house and I knew that I knew just from the safety aspect, not to touch it. It's not a toy. So I grew up with that, with that, uh, those safety rules in my head, but I never actually touched a gun until I joined the Marine Corps. I, I got out and it was, 
I thought that my path would lead me into law enforcement um, because that's initially what I was going to do when I first got out. Mm -hmm. And then I started working in a gun shop that was hiring at the time just to kind of pass the time. And the uh, the owner of the gun shop that I was working at said, oh, you're you're a, a Marine Corps firearms instructor. You should teach concealed carry classes here. You can get certified by the state. So I did that. And I guess for my teaching background in the, in the military, I just really enjoyed it. I, I loved teaching men, women, children um, at the gun shop I was working at. And it kind of evolved into um, into my career, that, which is now. Um, so, you know, what I found in the gun community was a sense of camaraderie and a sense of purpose that I was missing when I was, at, you know, uh, having just got out of the military. So it um, really, this, this firearms journey that I've started was really only within the past 10 years. And, and a lot of it happened after the military. Hmm. Hmm. So, but you were a drill instructor too, right? Yes, I was. How crazy is that? That's got to be. <laughs> okay. Be that's... careful. She's going to make you drop and give her 20. I know, right? <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, like, you, you it's, know? <laughs> it's the craziest job. I mean, you guys. Are... Oh, that's a great job. Amy, tell them how much fun you had. <laughs> It was one of the most rewarding, yes. but one of the most challenging times of my life. And just to give you, just to give you an idea, I'm four foot eleven, and at the <laughs> time when I was a drill instructor, I, my my active duty weight was about ninety five to one hundred five pounds. Yeah, but, make, make that, so we're about the same size, you and me. <laughs> oh, please! <laughs> but it, but it definitely, you know, it was just something about, uh, you know, being the example for 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 men and women who were twice my size, and they they could see me doing everything. And a lot of them told me afterwards that it was because of my size that kind of drove them. Well, she can do it, I can do uh, it. Wow! And so, yeah, it, it was a very you know, I wouldn't change trade that time time for anything. There's nothing, no other job like it. <laughs> yeah, I you know I had a uh, a client back way back when I was a banker and he was a, a drill instructor and uh, he would, he would tell me about, I, I you know, cr I just meant, you know, crazy by how intense you guys have to be, you know, for this, this, uh, you know, this, this couple of months, uh, what is it? Is it nine weeks? I feel like I'm, well, for I feel like, I feel like it's 12 weeks, 12 yeah. weeks. I feel like I'm on, I'm like John Candy on stripes. What do you guys have like a nine week program here? Lose some weight. And, <laughs> yeah. Do I so. have to wear a uniform? <laughs> All right. So yeah, <laughs> that's 12 weeks, it's 12 weeks. You guys have to be, you know, you're not just doing, you're doing 200% going a million miles an hour for 12 weeks. Day you know? and night. Day the, and night. They the, cannot, day and night. They cannot and night. let down. They have to keep that mantra up because the minute these yes. recruits, see her weaken or falter they've got her yeah i mean 18 to whatever 25 year olds yeah. I'm, I'm assuming or yeah. you know something like that mainly, right, that's the average age yeah, yeah 18, but mainly 18 19 year olds and their life their future is in your hands and you have to go 200 miles an hour for 12 weeks i mean it's just amazing i don't know how you, i don't know how you do it it's it gotta, it's gotta be the hardest it changed job my life because i was totally confused when i went in the military <laughs> and i'll tell you what if it hadn't been for my di's as hardcore as they were to me, in my face. Well, she'd have to use a ladder, but in my <laughs> face. I mean, it 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 truly straightened me out. And boy, I tell you, I thank the military to this day. Yeah, but you didn't get to see the women though. When I went through boot camp, I was in Orlando, so they trained men and women there. I didn't see any women. And uh -huh. I've I've seen female drill instructors. That that's a salty bunch there. Uh. <laughs> well, he's calling you salty, Amy. <laughs> Hey, I, I don't. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard those songs when they were marching by. Oh, <laughs> listen to you. Oh, yeah. You Navy guys didn't march. What are you talking about? That's <laughs> all we did. <laughs> so, so what did you, being a drill instructor, what did that, what did you take away from that? What, how did that change your life? You know, for, for me, it was the, the leadership aspect of it. You know, being able to get in front of a crowd, even if you were unsure about your, uh, unsure about yourself, um, just having, you know, the no, the no excuses mentality. There's, there's no excuse. I can't be sick today. I can't, I can't call in because if I, if I'm not there, who's, who's training, who's training these recruits. And so, you know, it, I, I have relaxed quite a bit from those days, but, but definitely the, the go getter attitude and the can't quit never, you know, you can't let them see you fail mentality has definitely stuck with me. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it can be cumbersome, but it, hey, I, you know, Amy. I again, I, I love it. Amy, yes. Have you ever been late? Uh, I have been. What? Yeah, I have to say, I have. Oh my! <laughs> not not been, I can't. I'm constantly. 
I can never be late. I can never be late. I, I, I have you know, to be I'm early. Here, I am always, I'm typically always early, but yeah. I, I have to say there have been times I, I have been late. <laughs> yeah. When I got out of the Army, they had to pay me a month and a half vacation because I would never go on vacation because I was that dedicated to do what I was doing. Oh, and, oh yeah. I had three I had three months see, when I got see, out. See, wow. so you and I are yeah. cut from the same cloth. It do, it does something to you, Mike. I'm telling you, military does something to you. The minute they cut your hair off, you're toast. They're you're theirs. Right? What's your hey, Amy? What's your what's the what's the best representation of a of a drill instructor? Oh in, my in what movie is the best representation? Ah. Well, I think we all know the answer to that. Honestly, uh, Gunny Ermy's mm. representation is pretty spot on. I mean. There, there was, I heard, you know, with that movie, he actually wasn't supposed to be no. the actor in that role. He was just a consultant, yep. but he had so many, so many corrections to the actor that was supposed to be a DI that the, uh, I guess their producers or directors said, you know what, just fill the role. So absolutely. He wasn't, he wasn't a uh, role playing. He was, he was actually being a drill. He was just well, being himself. What, what about no <laughs> time? He was just being himself. What yeah. about no time for sergeants with Andy Griffith? <laughs> That drill oh, sergeant. No. <laughs> that, that drill sergeant was the best. I'm telling you. Yeah, I'll tell you a real quick story about the so the guy that was supposed to play the uh the drill instructor, uh -huh. it was that the actor was the guy in the helicopter who was shooting the M sixty. Uh -huh. You remember that scene? Yeah, he was yeah. going, he just got yeah. to Vietnam and he was saying, you know, how can you shoot women and children? It's easy. You just don't lead them as much. That guy, yeah. he was the guy that was supposed to play the drill instructor. Yeah. And they had to tell him, like, look, man, we found somebody way, better. way better than so you. So it kind of affected him. I actually ended up, I met that guy because he was, when I back back when I was a banker, he came in to, like, cash a check. He had an account at our, at our place. He's still living on that one scene. His business card is the a still shot of him in the helicopter. Really? Yeah, shooting the M60. Oh, wow. And, I mean, he the guy couldn't walk five feet without telling somebody, hey, I was in this movie. This is me. Check me out. <laughs> So, so we're gonna, so Amy, we're gonna hold you over oh, for yeah. the for the next segment. I want to talk about your the, the podcast that you're a part of. Oh yeah, and then I want to sure. talk about the Florida Carry event that you guys just had, and then yeah. we want to talk a whole lot more about activism. Yeah, so hang in there, kid. Hey, Lead Slingers has really been helping out with the show this year. First with the Cover Your Ask Week sponsorship, and now they're sponsoring Magnum Interview with Seth Yon. Lead Slingers Whiskey is produced by seven combat veterans from the U.S. Army Rangers, U.S. Air Force, TACP, Special Forces, and paratrooper communities. Their love for America and fine whiskey is what the company is all about. So the next time you want to enjoy a sip of good whiskey, ask for Lead Slingers. Continuing from our last segment... Amy Dillon, before, welcome back. Before we go back, oh. before we go to uh, Amy, just wanted to do a shout out to some of the folks watching us on YouTube. Jimmy Wong, congratulations on your CCW. Yeah, happy to help. Tell all your friends and Ghost Hammer. Ghost Hammer says, "I'm just happening to be doing push-ups right now." See, I, so I knew it. <laughs> he should be. He's reminiscing. So, Amy, I'll tell you what. Could you do me a favor, Amy? Could you uh, could you tell Ghost Hammer to drop and do uh, drop 20. and give you twenty? <laughs> Just, you mean you mean in my DI voice? There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Drop and give me twenty. There you go. Uh, nice. That you heard do it. Her, Ghost hammer. By the way, we all just jumped out of our chairs. That, I got that really. That really was not. Uh, no, it was. I don't know <laughs> if I can give you twenty. I, I have like a ten and a five. No, she has to wear the hat. She has to wear the hat. It has to be crunched down over her nose. Right. And, exactly. And then the growl comes out like it'll <laughs> it'll make you think about it at night. That's, that, awesome. that's the secret. There it is. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, Amy, you're on a podcast, right? Which podcast are you, are you a part of? Yes, I, um, I'm part of the. I'm a co-host on the Second Amendment Foundation's Polite Society podcast. Nice, Polite Society is. Uh, oh, nice. uh, oh, Rob, right? Rob Morris. Yeah, Rob Morris. He's one of our co-hosts. You know, Paul he Lathrop, Amanda Suffolk, who I know you you guys had on the show uh, not too long ago. We did. She's awesome. And uh, Rob used to be out. He used to be a San Diegan. He and I used to do all kinds of NRA activism together. Oh wow! Yeah. His uh, very cool. Yeah, very very good guy. If you I haven't talked to him in a while, so tell him I said hello. So tell us about the podcast. What I what, will. what do people hear when they uh, when they tune into Polite Society? Well, we, we do stream every Monday night on Second Amendment Foundation's Facebook and YouTube page, and it's a, about a. 60 to 90 minute show we typically will have a guest on for about for the first part we'll talk about gun laws and then we'll also talk about uh defensive gun uses that uh, are in the news that week 
Nice. So it's a great show. Yeah, we'd love we'd love for your listeners to to join us if, if they if they can. We also uh, we record it live Monday night, and then it gets released that that same week. And so you just go on any podcast service and look for Polite Society, right? And the ref That's correct. The yeah. reference there is an armed society is a polite society, right? Have you seen Absolutely. her picture? I, I just I just reached out to be her friend on Facebook. Yeah. Oh, okay. That drill instructor, I would do anything she told me to do. Are you kidding? <laughs> she is cute as a little button, let me tell you. Because the ones I had were butt ugly. So I wish I'd have been in the military with you. That's all I can say. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, all right. Sorry about that. So, uh, uh, all right, cool. So Polite Society, which is really, really awesome. I highly recommend. I remember uh, I met Paul a couple times. Paul was actually, uh, when we started San Diego County Gun Owners, I don't know if you're familiar with San Diego County Gun Owners, but we're a political organization. I am. Oh, good. And we focus just on Second Amendment issues. When we were forming, Paul just happened to be at that meeting with Rob. I remember him vividly, and I've been watching his career, and I've been watching Polite Society grow. And I guess you guys, it, it, it was fairly recently that you guys got connected with Second Amendment Foundation, right? Yeah, so, we, so I've been a, a co-host on the show for about two years now. But I know they've been around, I mean, a, a lot. I mean, we're, we're almost, you know, 600 episodes in now. Nice. Um, but uh, Paul recently joined Second Amendment Foundation as the deputy director of new media. And so they absorbed uh, Polite Society podcast in that in that change. That's so awesome. It's been, you know, the, the added exposure has been great. And, and of course, Second Amendment Foundation, I've been attending their gun rights policy conference for the past four years now, even though last year was virtual, but, um, but they're a great organization. I mean, you want to talk about an organization that's there fighting for, for our gun rights. Definitely G uh, second amendment foundation is one of the top. I agree. The uh, second amendment foundation and, and uh, firearms policy coalition, firearms policy coalition, mm-hmm. yeah. a- anybody, honestly, every you know, I, I get asked that all the time. Like, Hey, which, which, which group or groups should I join? I got to tell you, if anyone's doing any kind of work anywhere related to the Second Amendment, join. Stroke, strike them a check. You know, yeah. um, I think they're all doing wonderful, wonderful work. But Second Amendment Foundation and Firearm, Firearms Policy Coalition are definitely head and shoulders. Um, yeah, well, and I don't want to say they're head and another, shoulders, but they're doing great work. If, if I could put in another plug to the sure. organization I also volunteer for, and this is a, this is all women. It's called the DC Project. Yeah, and oh, you yeah. can find out about us at dcproject.info. But I, I am the um, South Carolina uh, director. I'm looking, you know, I'm looking to to uh, a replacement for myself. Um, but anyway, that organization, we, I mean, we go to D.C. We talk to our representatives. We're very involved. Um, I spoke. I just actually spoke at the South Carolina House Judicial Committee on the Open Carry Act, which is introduced this year in the state of South Carolina. Which we're in South Carolina. We're one of the few states that in the South, a Southeast area that do not have an open carry allowance. And so mm-hmm. I just testified, um, you know, in support of the bill that would allow, allow permit holders to open carry. So, and that's a good, uh, uh, a, uh, opener for the Florida carry event that you guys just had. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I was just at the Florida carry event, which is another kind of the Florida, um, carry is the Florida state organization for gun rights. They're, they're really grassroots, and they just had a speaker event. This was the fourth of annual event they had this year, and I, I was speaking there. Um, you, you know, there there was about, I want to say, 10 to 15 speakers that were there just talking about our different perspectives and experiences. I, you know, my speech was about why the Second Amendment was important to me, my family's history with, you know, coming to the United States. And, and then I also spoke about my fiancé who – has Parkinson's disease and, and our fight in, uh, you know, in, in regards to his gun therapy where, where that, where, where that's a, a thing for him. So it was, it was a really good event. So very, in, very good, like fellowship and, you know, very good. What was the, what was the goal of the event? Well, the goal was really to really draw in the, the members of Florida carry into taking on, which is, I guess the theme of the show tonight taking on more of an active role as an advocate and, and, you know, and just kind of giving the motivation and, and initiative to, to other people that, Hey, your voice is important. And when, when everyone comes together, we really have strength in advocacy and, and especially with, you know, the administration that's in office now, I, I think it's very important that, you know, gun owners, if you haven't said anything before, been vocal about it, now's the time. 
I mean, absolutely now's the time. So you, you, in a, in a nutshell, um, your, your speech that you gave at the Florida carry event, why the second amendment is important to you and your family history. Um, t- tell us, you know, why is it, why is the second amendment important to you? Well, okay. My family actually grew up in the Philippines. So I'm Filipino American first generation. My grand, and this was back in world war two. Um, my grandfather under, you know, in the Philippines, they were being invaded by by the Japanese Imperial Army at the time. My grandfather was fighting for the U.S. because the Philippines didn't have its own military during this time. Uh, while this was going on, the Japanese um, Imperial Army actually invaded my dad's house. My dad was seven years old at the time, and they came in, it literally invaded the house, took it over, uh, my grandmother with my dad, who was seven, and six of his brothers, they all had to flee the house with the clothes on their backs or whatever, and they hid out in the mountains and, mm. you know, escaped. Um, and while they were there, you know, they were getting bombed. I actually had two uncles who, you know, they they died when they were babies or, you know, little, um, because they because of the injuries sustained during the bombing. And... My my dad, you know, my grandfather never came back. Um, he was never found after the war. And as soon as my dad in the Navy, he was granted, my family was granted citizenship because of my grandfather's sacrifice. Hmm. And he came right over to the U.S. My grandmother remained in the Philippines. And it's kind of a sad story because she, I think she remained there just hoping my grandfather would come back. But um, my, grand, my, my dad came over here and, you know, raised us here. And I, I was always raised with, the United States is, you know, um, he taught he taught me that why this country was so great, and it's because of the Constitution and one of those rights being the Second Amendment, having the right to bear to bear arms. You know, I, it's hard to say whether a foreign army is going to try, but I don't see that happening because every citizen has the has the right to defend themselves, and and whether it's against a criminal whether it's against, you know, a foreign attack, we are the only country in the world that has that right. And I think that that is the forefront, you know, of, of the messaging that I, I, at least I want, I want to relay. And just being in the military and having had the opportunity to see other countries and how every, the rest of the world lives, it, it is a very, you know, it's, it's a very, um, you know, special you know, being in this country and, and having those rights, having the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to freedom of to you know to bear arms, it, it's it's very unique that that I think a lot of people forget that the Second Amendment wasn't written for deer hunting or you know yeah. it wasn't mm-hmm. even it wasn't even written to to defend against criminals. It, it was just that we are a free people, we're a free nation. Yeah, you know, it drives me crazy when people say, "Hey, you don't need a gun in modern day America." I mean, look, we'll we'll never. Will never be, you know, that, and you know, they point to some undeveloped country or some corrupt country or something like that, uh, you know. So you don't need a gun. Well, I, I tend to agree that the United States is never going to become that, but it's because we have the Second Amendment, you know. So when, exactly. when we're, we're at a place, uh, you know, uh, politically and culturally, where, um, you know, we're never going to, uh, you know, need to. Well, it, uh, do the things that some of these other countries, you know, we'll never have to, you know, worry about some of these things that other corrupt countries have to worry about. But it's because we have the first and yeah. the second and the third and the exactly. fourth and the fifth well, amendment. They won't inv- other country, take it away. Other and we're going to have to worry about other it. Other countries will not invade the United States as long as the United States carries firearms. That's right. The British tried it and failed miserably. Exactly. So <laughs> that's what slows a lot of countries down. I mean, because. They know if they come after us, we'll have more for them than they have for us. Yeah. Well, and and really, you know, we have to we have to remember that we we were set up to be our self reliant self. We're self governing. Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. self governed people. We're self reliant. We don't need the government. We don't need to rely on the police or the government. Or, you know, m- military police state. We we have the opportunity. Yeah. That's right. To, to, to be our on our own. So listen and, to listen to Amy on Polite Society podcast. Amy, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for your service and thank you for what you continue to do for the Second Amendment. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Thanks for watching this clip from Gun Owners Radio. You can watch us live every Sunday from 4 to 6 p.m. California time right here on our YouTube channel, or if you're in the San Diego area, you can listen to us on 1170 AM. We're also available on your favorite podcast platform for free. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can help restore and protect the Second Amendment, not just in California, but across the country.